Jennifer Carlson is the visionary behind Baby Gourmet. It's Canada's leading mission-driven organic meal and snack brand for babies and toddlers. It was inspired by a six-month-old daughter who, of course, has since grown uh, along with Baby Gourmet. The idea, the origin, dates back to a fateful day at the Calgary Farmer's Market, and today Baby Gourmet has grown and become the go-to brand for nutritious, natural, and organic baby food products, not only here in North America, but now making inroads in China. And now, after 15 years of building Canada's leading brand in this category, Jennifer is launching the next phase of Baby Gourmet as she joins the Hero Group. Uh, the Goodness of Nature portfolio, Hero Group is a company based out of Switzerland, we say, Hello and welcome, Jennifer Carlson, to the Leadership Standard. Hi, Gare. Thank you so much for having me. There's uh, so many accolades. Uh, I could run down the awards, the accomplishments. Let me see. You're the TELUS Trailblazer Award winner from the 2014 RBC Canadian Women's Entrepreneur Awards. Um, you've got a passion for all things culinary, but also in addition to leading a baby food revolution, you're the mother of two very well-fed children. Do you ever stop right now, even as you think about all that, and kind of pinch yourself and say, geez, how did I get here? You know, I do, you're right, I do. I do sometimes <laughs> think about, you know, it, that 15 years have gone by and, you know, so much of my time, my heart, my soul, my children's journey um, has been in building this company. And, you know, it's interesting though, too, a lot of people will say, could you ever imagine yourself here? And the, the reality is yes, like I had a vision. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew back in 2006 that I wanted to sell to Hero. And here I am selling to Hero 15 years later. So I had a vision, I achieved it. I, and I'm, I'm just thrilled that I, I persevered and I got to where I wanted to go. Naturally, I have to ask the obvious question. And, and since we love exploring the themes of leadership and by, by nature and definition, vision is a big part of leadership. Where did this vision to get connected with the hero group uh, really originate from? Sorry, I had a bit of a pause there. Um, I was actually inspired by a woman by the name of Lizzie Van, who was a pioneer in organic food for babies. She was out of the UK and she founded a company called Organics. And in 2006, I followed her career. And in 2006, she sold Organics to the Hero Group. And I thought, wow, what a, what a great end game. Like, and I read up about Hero. I knew you know, what their mission was. And I obviously knew what her mission was. And I just thought, what a great partnership. I would love that for my company one day. But it was Lizzie Van that inspired me to start Baby Gourmet. It was her cookbook that I bought. And I thought, oh my gosh, these recipes are gourmet. They, I would eat them myself. This is what everyone should be feeding their babies. And, and it helps develop their palate. It's more interesting combinations rather than just um, you know, pureed peas. So that was really kind of the founding inspiration. You know, Stephen Covey was famous for saying, begin with the end in mind. So as you look at the photograph here of the Calgary Farmer's Market, when you walked in to set up shop and your daughter at the time was only six months old, just tell us again, like so many people walk in to their first day of their new business filled with so many unknowns, but are you sharing with us that you actually had that clear goal in mind? I actually did. <laughs> It, it, it's very, you know, it, it seems so far away. It was, I knew there was a long ways to get there. Um, but I will say that, yeah, when I, um, when I walked into that farmer's market, my goal was to really test the market, was to understand what other moms are looking for is, do I just have a great idea? I didn't think I just had a good idea that I would appreciate. I thought I had something that all moms would want, but I really wanted, you know, direct consumer feedback. And yeah, at that point I had written a, a short, I had written my business plan and part of my business plan was an exit strategy. That's, that, that's just such an unbelievable story because as you can appreciate, I've heard hundreds and maybe even thousands of origin stories. Rarely 
uh, Jennifer, have I ever heard that kind of story in terms of idea to exit and or what Michael Gerber talked about in the Emith Revisited in terms of how do you get your business ready for franchising? I just, I'm just curious, what sort of advice? Uh, so whoever's listening or watching to us right now, and maybe they're percolating an idea. Hey, I just talked to someone this morning from Texas that's going through the same thing. What would you tell them? You know, I would, I would say that was a starting point for me is to the importance of having a vision, close your eyes, see what you want to be able to see. What does it look like? The journey is going to be different and there's going to be so many different obstacles. It's not going to happen the way you thought it was, but if you have an end game that you know that you're working towards, it makes it so much easier to deal with the challenges and the obstacles and everything that comes in your way along the way is because, you know, I'd always tell myself, whenever something bad happened or whenever there was a significant challenge, I would tell myself, this isn't the end of my story. The end of my, I know what the end of my story is. And it was really crazy because it was me at a boardroom table signing papers where I was executing an, a transaction. I saw it. And I remember thinking, this isn't the end of my story because I need to get to that boardroom. <laughs> like, it was really strange. So I think having a vision is so critical, having an end game, and just being able to be fluid along the way to get there um, is really important. You know, I, I just love the idea of this North Star, this tangible North Star in your vision that you could see your way uh, through, uh, you know, towards. But also I'm wondering, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs and CEOs go through this. In your case, I know you, you've got a sister who is very much involved. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts from a leader's point of view on the inner circle and the value that the inner circle, no one can do it alone. It takes a village to raise an yeah. entrepreneur, but I, I just the love, I think everyone, Jennifer, would love to hear your experiences on that. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with you. Your team is everything. I would never be here without, without my team. Um, and my team starts with my sister. So I was, you know, when I came up with the concept and the idea, I went to Jill and wanted her input and she has she at the time she had had three babies and had fed them all homemade food so I knew she'd appreciate what my goal was and she really liked the idea and I thought it would be something fun that we could do together and Jill has been along with me for the entire ride she's the head of innovation and quality control so really using the best ingredients she tastes every ingredient before it goes to production and her and I develop all of our innovation together. So, you know, the, the development of our product line and the quality really does reside in the hands of Jill. And, you know, so I, yeah, like you say that the team is critical. Um, I feel at this place of where I'm at today, I've got a really ideal team that, you know, has been with the business for a long time. Um, and I heavily rely on them to, they're the professionals. I just, you know, pull the strings and make sure they all work well together. Um, and like I said, work with Jill to, to really set our innovation. But, you know, having a, having a team and I always look at where's my core strength and where are the holes that I need to fill. And, you know, those are the people that you really rely on that I don't think I can do everything. You've got to be able to surround yourself with people that know more than you do. Is there is there some sort of leadership wisdom you've accumulated along the way as it relates to the selection process of who's on the bus, who's not, and who gets to stay on the bus and on which seats? Just wondering what you know your experience was through the whole baby gourmet odyssey. You know, I would say that my basic philosophy is treat people the way you'd like to be treated. And I think just genuine kindness and empathy is so critical. And, you know, being able to have a sense of humor, um, being able to work really hard and commit the time you need to when you need to, but also being, you know, being understanding and flexible. And, you know, I think giving your team all those choices and selections and that makes them want to work harder. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a time in my journey with Baby Gourmet that earlier on when we had raised private equity that um, another leader was put in place and I didn't have the experience to run a multi-million dollar business 
you know, I was in their view, probably just a mom with an idea that liked to cook. They didn't really acknowledge my business acumen at that time and had put another leader in place. You know, I, I guess one of which didn't necessarily work out well. That happened twice. It did not work out well. And I would say, you know, as an entrepreneur in giving that leadership advice would be have confidence and believe in yourself. All those things which are required to really protect shareholders' investment and grow a business, those are all really critical um, components that a lot of times a hired manager is not going to be able to replace. So, you know, my advice in that at that time is, you know, have confidence in yourself. If you don't know something, surround yourself with people that do and you'll be fine. You know, I think one of the favorite things about entrepreneurial stories and leadership stories are when we hear we hear the real life uh, examples of the scrapes, the bumps and the bruises. So Jennifer, roll up your sleeves. <laughs> Tell us about the time and don't throw anybody under the bus publicly, but s- see if you can muster the specifics of what was the toughest leadership lesson. You know how they say that there's no better teacher than failure. What was the time when you got your nose bloodied and, and beat around a little bit and what you learned as a result? You know, I would, there's been so many of them. I honestly, uh, it's, it's surprising that I'm standing today. It's surprising. Like there's a lot, there's so many obstacles that, that I've been through and, and challenges, um, losses. I would say the biggest would be, you know, when a hired manager was put in place and they tried to diminish my value um, because they were threatened. I think take us into the meeting. See if you can't take us into the meeting and, and play it as though it were, you know, it was old time 1930s radio and you're describing the scene. Okay, so let's, I'm going to, I am going to give you a, a, a scenario where I had just hired and I was on the board of directors. We had all joined, we agreed, we had hired this CEO who in one of our, probably this, the first week that they had started, I was a part of entrepreneurial organization EO and he came up to me just, I was in the hallway somewhere, came up and said, you know, I was just looking at the numbers and it appears that you are a part of an organization and we, we pay the funds for it. I said, yep. Yeah. And he said, I'd like you to tell me what makes you think you're so, des- you're, you're deserving of that privilege. And I said, well, because I'm the entrepreneur and I'm the founder and I'm trying to build my skill set by surrounding myself with other entrepreneurs yeah, I don't think that you're worthy of that. And I don't think, and we're going to be cutting that out of the budget. That was the first week that he was hired. By week two, he, we, we, were, we were, I think, on a business trip. And he had said something along the lines of, um, we need to talk about your, your compensation. And I said, okay, what would you like to talk about? And he said, I could hire anyone in this hotel lobby to replace you for $60,000 a year. And I thought, I, I think I was stumped. I knew there were some red flags, but at that moment, that's when you recognize that someone you hire to come in to work with you to help build a beautiful brand is threatened by you and is trying to diminish you and diminish your worth and tell you that you can be replaced with anyone in a hotel lobby <laughs> for, for nothing. So- So Jennifer, as you can appreciate, now we're into the nitty gritty and now we're into very familiar conversations that I think anyone who's had an extended business career has been inside. Mm -hmm. How did you recover from the shock and awe and the insult, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. also eventually how did it play out? How did it get resolved and what did you learn? You know, it, um, it, that was probably the most challenging. That was just the start of the most challenging relationship I've ever experienced in a business environment where, you know, that, that um, threat constantly had to try to control and be reminded of that they are the boss and that you are the employee. And on a constant basis, it was very demoralizing until the point where I was essentially bullied out of the company. So he came to me with letterhead, baby gourmet letterhead telling me that they were not renewing my contract. And that again was, you know, that was maybe a year after that initial conversation. And I think I was relieved. 
I think, um, you know, I ended up negotiating a, a contract because it, at the very point, I was the heart and soul of the company. I'm the spokesperson. I'm the innovator. And this is what makes our company unique and special. I'm not a Gerber. And so many people would say, you know, you're, you know who you're up against. You're up against Gerber and Heinz. How do you plan on, on competing? And I said, they've all missed the mark. I'm a mom making food for other moms. They're going to trust me. I've got credibility and moms listen to moms. I've got a different card game that, and they're not in it. And that's why we were successful because of the foundation I built with the credibility of the brand. So they knew they couldn't get rid of me, but they also knew I threatened them. So, you know, I was essentially kind of bullied out of the company, out of the day-to-day -day operation of the business, which I accepted and, you know, not very willingly, but I did because it was the right thing for the company and fighting it for, and also for my mental health, it wasn't good to constantly be fighting it. Um, I think from a leadership perspective, it was knowing in my heart of hearts that I was still, despite the, the turmoil with management, I was still the heart and soul. I lived and breathed the company and the brand and I knew what it stood for. And I just had to try to put that aside and just focus on what I could control. And I honestly had to wait to the day that he resigned. And the day that he resigned, um, I cried. I cried like about five different, I'd stop my car and pull over crying. And I thought I survived. I outlasted him. He's finally gone. He was toxic in our company. He created a very toxic culture where people, you know, were afraid of everyone and they feared him. And it was just a toxic, which was against everything I believe in. I believe in treating the people the way you want to be treated. I believe that's how you build a strong team, open communication, not, you know, taking responsibility and accountability, all important factors. Um, and then when he had left, um, the board came to me and said, we recognize that we need you to come back in. You need to, you need to reset the strategy, the vision, the culture of the company, and we need an exit. And I did that in 13 months. <laughs> Jennifer, forgive me. And I'm just going to pay you the ultimate compliment if it's okay. But as I hear this story, I can't help but wonder, and I'm sure some of our listeners and viewers are wondering, do you find striking parallels between your story what happened with baby gourmet and what went down with Steve jobs when he was ousted and then came back to Apple. It's, you know, it's funny that people have made that, that comparison before. And I think I, you don't ever compare me to Steve jobs, but it's a very, you know, it is similar where, you know, the, the founder can be very passionate, but they can also cause a lot of noise because they know what's the right thing. And, the, and it doesn't always agree with the higher powers that be. And, you know, it's, it's a curse and it's a blessing to have that kind of passion and drive and desire. Um, but it threatens a lot of people. So, you know, yeah, I see that, it, you know, having me come back in and be able to reset the strategy and reset the team. And we've got a phenomenal culture and get through an exit of a lifetime in 13 months, you know, was a pretty, a pretty big feat. Um, but yeah, there's probably some similarities of what happens when you get rid of a founder and what can happen. And then what can happen when you bring them back. It's revitalized and there's new energy and new innovation. There's a phrase uh, that's been kicking around um, in, in my circles about there's a big difference since COVID, big difference between peacetime CEO and wartime CEO. And, and in that spirit, uh, what advice would you have for anyone who needs a reset, whatever, whether it's a return of a founder or not, but I think there's a lot of companies, there's two words that became popular through 2020, which was unprecedented followed by pivot. So <laughs> when I hear reset, what insights can you share about the reset from baby gourmet that might still be relevant today for leaders and CEOs looking to do what you did? You know, when I think of reset, I think of you know, let's let's step back and look at the entire organization as a whole. Um, look at your what you're offering. Look at who your customer is. How is how has your customer changed? Have they? Um, you know, for example, you know, I had to step back and look at the business and think, how has our customer changed? 
They have significantly. Uh, we require a complete rebrand. We need to look at our formulations, the industries. We need to look at trends and what can we do to adapt our product line to make it more suitable for what the market's looking for today. You know, we've had this a, a culture of, of fear and negativity. How do we shift that? And how do we make sure that we don't have anyone still on the team that is carrying that culture forward? How do we make sure that everyone is aligned to the same vision? And what can you do differently? And you use the word pivot. You know, I use that word quite a bit too, is you hit walls, you hit, you hit endpoints. You need to pivot. You need to look at something different. How could you market it different? Is there a new customer? You know, we were never really strong on e-commerce in 2021 or 2020 taught us all. Everyone needs to be very savvy on e-commerce and need to look for different outlets. If it's not going to be retail, how do you get your product to your customer? Um, what new innovation or product lines are going to cater to your market? So there's so many different areas you could look at to reset your business. For us this year, it was really about resetting our story, our founder story, our credibility, why customers loved us from day one and why they should still love us today. It was looking at our packaging. It was very outdated. It hadn't been updated in 10 years. Um, it was our innovation, you know, just, it was a bunch of, and then really it was the team. I needed to make changes to the team to make sure that everyone on the bus was all aligned with the path forward. Jennifer, I want to congratulate you on the, the Baby Gourmet brand. And I just think it's, it's, it's such a great name to start with. What's the story of the brand behind Baby Gourmet? How did you come up with it? And what, you know, how much credit do you assign to uh, the marketing function in terms of being able to expand and grow? You know, so the baby for me brand honestly came from me making these recipes for my daughter that I found were gourmet for a baby, you know, vanilla, banana, berry risotto and apple, chia, cinnamon, you know, just interesting combinations and blends. They were gourmet. So that's where it came baby gourmet. I thought of something that was simple that would pop out. And I remember saying it in my head and thinking I can visualize that as a national brand. I could, I visualized what it looked like and I could see that just flowing as, you know, it's spelled premium and baby food. You kind of got premium baby food from the name baby gourmet. Um, and then in terms of marketing, uh, so my background is in marketing and I love, I love all aspects of marketing. So I really, you know, from the very beginning, wanted to establish ourselves as not just a premium organic brand, but as, you know, moms making food for other moms, that there's a real emotional experience with feeding your baby. And I wanted to capture that with, with parents. And I found too, moms are very viral when they find something they like, they like to talk about it. And I wanted them talking about our food. So very early on, the way that we positioned our product in the market uh, was very close to my heart. And, you know, kind of lost its way a little bit over a couple of years, but really bringing that story back in house, um, updating our brand with a premium positioning was really, um, you know, I was really close to it. And, and I do work very close with our marketing department, and how we position and move the brand forward. I, uh, like I say, I, I think you and I could talk uh, brand strategy all day, but I want to bring it back a little bit to leadership in terms of influences and mentors, whether they are authors, thought leaders. I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, the role that whether it's influences and mentors play, peer advisory groups, just share your thoughts for, again, any leader listening or watching, um, you know, how much do you attribute uh, your success to the influence of, of, of mentors, coaches, uh, peer groups, et cetera? You know, so I, you know, I don't have a specific mentor. I have, I've worked really hard from the very beginning at, at developing a broad network of people. So I would attend events, um, I would join associations. I did everything I could to try to develop as much knowledge as I could in the industry and create those contacts. So if I, to this day, if I ever have a question or I've got a, a massive uh, deck full of contacts that I can reach out to to ask questions or ask for direction. I feel very fortunate with my network of people that I have um, that I can reach out to. I think, you know, I've, I read a lot of books. Um, I read a lot of business books. It's, you know, I like, I don't know. It's just something I 
I've always, and you mentioned the E-Myth Revisited. I read that book years ago. And the thing that stood out for me the most was working in your business versus on your business. And I, that's what I was doing at the farmer's market. I read that while I was working at the farmer's market. I remember thinking, I'm just churning a wheel here at the farmer's market and I'm working in the business, just trying to survive to sell that food on the weekends. This is not what I need to do. I need to step back and work on the business and look at the big picture, look at the strategy, revisit where do I want to go and how do I get there? And so I think reading books has been a really, a, a really integral part of developing my knowledge on business and leadership. Um, and I think too, just my leadership team here at Baby Gourmet, like I, I go to them if I have a question or if I want to think about something differently, you know, tapping into the people that I'm really close to uh, can also provide really great advice. It says here, according to the pre-show notes that our crack investigative team led by Stephen Christofferson detailed, it says here that you don't consider yourself to be an academic, but you're more of the hard worker, self-taught with a lot of natural business acumen. Tell us more about natural yeah. business acumen, but where do you think that came from? You know, I think, um, so my father was a marketing instructor at SAIT. And I remember even as a kid being very entrepreneurial and I would have these crazy little business ideas and he would always encourage me but he would talk through the process with me. Like I remember learning the four P's when I was eight years old. Like if you'd say, okay, if you're going to sell these homemade cinnamon buns, where are you going to do it? What do you, you know, what's the price point? Who's your customer? Like he would ask me these questions to make me think about those things. And so, I, you know, I would say, you know, going, not being an academic, I didn't necessarily love school, but as soon as you find something you love to do and you're really passionate and believe in, you know, I'd give it 150%. So I think to just, you know, having my dad as, a, as an advisor and helping me look at things differently um, when I was very young and wanting to come up with my crazy business ideas and working, I, I always, you know, love to work. I think I, like most kids had a paper route when I was 10 and couldn't wait to get my first job. I think when I was 14 at a coffee shop and I was always about, I wanted to save money and Again, my father taught me about the importance of saving and money and credit and all these things. So those were, I think, just a skill set I learned early from my environment. What are you curious about right now as, as you talk about business books and, and looking forward to the future of 2021 and beyond? What, what are you curious about? What's on your night table? <laughs> it's funny right now. I'm reading a book called High Input Management from the CEO of Intel. And I just started it and my dog, I think got a hold of it and just tore it up. So I'm, that one's off, but that was what I was reading. Um, you know, I, um, I don't know. I, I kind of look and see what I, like I look for recommendations and what people recommend and I'll usually dig into them. So it's, yeah, I don't, I don't know what, 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 what else was part of that question? I'm sorry. Well, if you had the name, let's just say for the fun of it, uh, Jennifer, your three top all-time business books of all time that have most influenced the success of Baby Gourmet, what would they be? You know, so one of them, and I would have to say is not a business book, but it was The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. And I think that transformed my whole way of looking at life and about overcoming and, and being open to anything that comes your way. And that there's a path in front of you and you just have to be open to it. It wasn't a business book, but it was like a life learning book. Um, you know, I love Tony Robbins books. They were super influential. So Waken the Giant Within, I read when I was 18. And it, you know, it was a long time ago, but I think that too just set my mindset to think bigger and to have a vision and, you know, what it took to realize a vision. You know, I, I think the detailed business books are fine, but for me, it was the ones that made you look at a much bigger picture that changed your mindset that were more impactful. Um, what was and another one I have to say too was Faith Popcorn. It was called Clicking. It was a book on marketing from the 90s. I think it was the 90s. And that was one of the first books too. My dad gave me that book. 
that really made me think about marketing and the way you position how you can influence sales and how you can determine your demographic and the, you know, the importance of creating a product or service that people want and they want to buy. Just listening to you now, I want to, um, I might not quote it exactly, but if we were to paraphrase that Paulo Cuello quote around when you really dream something and really hold on to it, the universe conspires to make it happen. I'm not, I know the words aren't exactly precise, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on, on that. When someone's watching you now, and maybe there's someone who's starting a new business or looking to pivot, explain a little bit about why the, alchem uh, why the alchemist is always a good journey to go on. <laughs> I know, and you know, a lot of people, it sounds a little bit, may sound a little bit nutty to have that vision of exactly what you said, which is when you ask the universe, it delivers. It's the power of, of manifestation and, and visualization. Um, it's very, very powerful. And that other book is The Secret. Those ones that seem a little altruistic, but honestly, if you can step outside of it, it, it just helps set your vision and it helps you really recognize that whatever your path is, there's gonna be so many challenges and obstacles, but if you've got that finish good mindset of where you wanna go, you know, you, it gives you the tools to deal with and manage and navigate, you know, the, the rough roads. Your, your baby gourmet products have touched so many people, but I just want you to take us on the journey from, there you are at one at, at, there was a time when you're in a kitchen with recipes, yeah. but then the brand and the products have touched literally tens of thousands of people everywhere. Is there one particular client story, customer sto story, Jennifer, that's really touched your heart that, that always lives with inside you? You know, there, there have been, so many I can't like over the just even from the farmers market just seeing it was honestly seeing mothers faces when they were buying this food and feeding it to their baby and how relieved you know moms carry so much guilt around about not being able to make their own food or not being good enough or you know being a mom is a really tough job and making food from scratch is really hard and time consuming and people feel guilty if they're not doing the very best so if you can give them the tools and give them the food to alleviate their stress and their level of guilt, for me, that's why I do what I do. And so I think it was really just seeing when I see parents feed them the food and how relaxed and joyful they feel in that experience. Um, you know, but one that really stands out for me is that we had a, a lady reach out to us about seven, six years ago, six or seven years ago. And her daughter had just had heart surgery and she didn't know what to feed her and, and how to make food. And she had a lot of questions. So Jill and I had made a big batch of all different homemade baby foods and we drove it over to her house and we met with her and we met her and her baby. Um, and we spent about two hours there with her. And I remember thinking Jill and I both walked away feeling so good. Like this is, this is what it's all about. Like we're, you know, we're actually at a place where we can do this. And it felt so good. And there was no PR attached to it. We weren't promoting it. There was no social media. This was genuinely out of the, it, this is who Jill and I are. We just wanted to go and we just wanted to help this mom who felt like she was struggling. And it was after that meeting that Jill and I started the Heart of Baby Gourmet, which is our uh, philanthropic arm of the company where we donate food. Um, to a multitude of families from different food banks, but even to parents that have children in the hospital that are looking for healthy food to feed them while they're out of the house. And we have a whole bunch of different ways that we do it. But, you know, that for me was very impactful was that we can actually help people. I think those stories, Jennifer, are the, the heart of what makes any uh, leader successful and in, in it past the accolades, past the awards, and the PLs, it's those real, honest to goodness, real life customer stories that and experiences that 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 explain why we do what we do. So, on a more personal note, let's explore, shall we say, the up close and personal side of Jennifer Carlson in a way that not even her children uh, have heard. How's that? 
Oh dear. All right. What does that entail? Are you, are you ready for that? Are you ready for this? <laughs> sure. I, I have no idea what's going to happen in terms of how you answer some of these very rapid fire questions. If there's one room in your house that resonates with you the most, what is it? My kitchen living room area. You're on the road, Highway 2, traveling north to Edmonton. Top five songs on your playlist. Oh, my gosh. That's a tough one. Top five songs. <sighs> there's Jennifer Carlson. She's in her car. She might even play some air drums on the way. But what's on that top five playlist? You know, um, oh my gosh. I'm trying to think what that would, I don't know. I listen to so many different. It, Name I like, five, let's go. Okay, um, Just, Blinding uh, Lights by The Weeknd. Um, Coldplay, Vida La what is it? I can't remember. You're really, you're really throwing me for a loop here. I'm not good with those quick ones. This is what, I think Eamon and Finley, am I pronouncing it right? Yeah. This is what they want to hear. They want to hear mom squirm a little bit, right? Gosh. Um, I know. I'm, well, I'm just thinking I was on the highway with my daughter. What were we listening to? Um, I, don't, I, I don't know the song names, but I'm going to say something by the Smiths, something by um, Modest Mouth, Mouse, something by, um, oh my gosh. Okay, stop it right there. You're in COVID. You're in lockdown. You've got to binge watch. What was the greatest binge watching experience from 2020 for you and your family? Uh, Queen's Gambit. Did you actually take up chess as a result? I did not. Okay. On a scale of one to 10, how weird are you? Eight. Why? Um. Uh, because I'm not completely out there. I'm still a little bit reserved, but I like to be really goofy and I'm not, I don't see myself as conventional. Okay. So they've decided the powers that be at Netflix have decided they're going to create the Jennifer Carlson biopic. Who would you choose to play you in the lead role? Oh my gosh, really? Why do you throw these ones? These are really hard. Who would play me? Oh gosh. I'm thinking of Aaron Brockovich would be Julia Roberts. <laughs> All right. Now let's transition, Jennifer, since we're having so much fun with this, into what we call the Lipton Pivot Survey. And this was inspired by French journalist Bernard Pivot, subsequently honored by uh, James Lipton from inside the actor studio. So this is extremely rapid fire. Are you ready? Okay. What turns you on? Moonlight. What turns you off? Bullies. What sound or noise do you love? The rain. What sound or noise do you hate? Nails on a chalkboard. Jennifer, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Oh, gosh, I feel like I have the best job in the world. Professional athlete. What profession under no circumstances would you ever do? Doctor. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear our heavenly father say when you arrive at the pearly gates? We've been waiting for you. Welcome. <laughs> Jennifer, before we let you go, do you have what we call a personal creed or motto? Four or five words that you just live by and believe in with your entire fiber of your being. So I do. Um, you, you know, and it's interesting. A friend of mine started this this revolution called finding the good and when she i've lived this way and i've lived this motto for so many years but i've never had the words attached to it so when i saw find the good um that for me was everything that i live for every day
it's gratitude. It's trying to find the silver lining in any negative situation. I like to be positive. I, I don't like to see the worst. I like to feel good and feel the, feel positive. And the best way to do that is to find the good. Um, and so I would say, find the good. If you could somehow magically step into my shoes, what question would you ask yourself that I have failed to do so, so far? <laughs> um, that's a really difficult question. You've asked me more than I could have ever imagined, uh, more than any other interviewer. Um, how do you feel now that you've accomplished your goal? Now that you have realized your right vision. reached the summit you've reached your summit you've now you know your vision has come to fruition what now and how would you respond i would say um after a very long weekend of sleeping and recovering um i would i am really excited on the next chapter of my journey i'm i'm really excited of flipping the page and starting a new one and I'm excited to continue to work in a job and a role that I love. I get to continue to lead and drive Baby Gourmet and I get to work with fantastic partners in doing that. And I wanna see where my career goes. Like I'm excited on another level of my career at this point. Can I ask right. you a question? And you feel, you definitely do not have to answer. I just was really inspired by listening and it's cool to have a chance to talk to you. It sounds like you were very sure the whole journey, you know, from the vision to everything. Was there ever a time when you weren't sure or you were like doubting yourself? Or was it during that CEO? Like, yeah. you know, how do you overcome that? It, absolutely. It, it was during that time with that CEO. And I remember thinking to myself, I, cause I treated this company almost like a, like a baby. And I would compare it to my baby has grown up and become a meth addict and there's nothing I can do about it. There's, I physically can't control anything. They have to figure it out on their own. And that's how I had to look at it. So I did kind of, I did lose my belief for a little while there where I just thought, I don't, and, and I remember him telling me, you know, um, Baby Gourmet is going, is my, it, what did he say? It was his end game, that it was going to be his legacy. And I remember thinking, dear God, if that ever happens, that this is his legacy, like that, that you know, and I remember thinking it can't be, it can't be, <laughs> but yeah, when someone keeps pushing that and, and demoralizing you, it's really hard not to think that maybe everything, maybe my vision was wrong or maybe it's not what it's supposed to be. So yeah, you definitely second guess yourself and, you know, but I think there was just that little nudge inside me that had to keep believing. I love how'd that. You get, uh, how'd you get your mojo back? Do you remember the day, for example, when it suddenly you said enough? I'm picking, like Rocky Balboa, I'm picking myself up off the canvas and I'm going to slug again. Yeah, I think it was, it was after, you know, I had left the company. I was still consulting, but it was really, you know, it was not exceptionally rewarding. Um, it was when I, I started actually another company called Thirsty Naturals. And it, it's a personal care line of products developed specifically for teenagers. And I remember thinking, my kids inspired me. So I need to look at ways that I can be re-inspired and I need to start over. And I, this is not going to define me. I need to start over. And, and it was starting Thirsty Naturals that, you know, put me back on the map. And I think to also taking a job at SAIT, I helped, the, um, I was a chair of, of their business program. It was a chair of innovation and new ventures. I took that role. And I think when I took that role and I started thirsty outside of baby gourmet was when all of a sudden, you know, I think the board of baby gourmet realized like what's happening here. She's mm. clearly, she's got some brains. Clearly she's got mm. something to offer. How did we not see this? Um, I think that was what triggered, you know, kind of everything coming back together that I didn't just crumble and fall away. Like I think he thought I was just going to fall away. And when I didn't, that was, I think, what established me for where I am today. Uh, Jennifer, it's been an absolute delight for people listening or watching. Where can they connect with you online? Uh, on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. <laughs> 
Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, we so appreciate uh, Jennifer Carlson for stopping by from Baby Gourmet. And if you want to know more about Tech Canada and its world-class uh, programs, uh, check out the website, www.tec-canada.com. So what was it that Jennifer Carlson spoke about that made you stop and think? For me, my biggest takeaway was the red flag from the new hire that came in and completely disrupted culture and some of the things that you want to be aware of. But what was it for you? Were there things that Jennifer shared, whether it was find the good or some of the other things she talked about? Feel free uh, to share your thoughts. Uh, my personal email is gair, G-A-I-R, at uh, gairmaxwell.com. If you enjoyed the leadership standard, feel free to share with others in your uh, in, in your online social networks. Uh, you know the you know the usual: like, subscribe, and share. And um, so, because you never know, we we don't know whether it's the E Myth Revisited getting off that hamster wheel, or as Jennifer mentioned, uh, the Alchemist with Paulo Quayo. There's no way <laughs> that we know whether someone else is gonna grab hold of the clutch and, and kick it up a gear in the new frontier. So on behalf of everyone with Tech Canada, uh, with headquarters in Calgary and the fantastic team, Alexander, Catronel, Mark, Stephen, thanks so much for joining us here on the Leadership Standard.